on World News Tonight. Global condemnation. The UNGA condemns Russia's occupation of four areas from Ukraine with a two-thirds majority. Optimistic signs. Europe may have a way out of the energy crisis with Russia's cooperation at the helm of the operation. Continuing turmoil. A month on since the morality murder, the civil unrest continues in Iran despite the growing death toll. And football frenzy. Freestyle footballers take to the stage to show off their skills. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. We start off tonight with the updates on the conflict in Ukraine. President Biden condemned the missile strikes across Ukraine launched by President Vladimir Putin of Russia, saying they served no military purpose and again demonstrated the utter brutality of Mr. Putin's illegal war on the Ukrainian people. As if born again, Ukrainian rescue crews today freed a family from beneath a building destroyed by a Russian missile. While in Kyiv, Ukrainian fighter jets today patrolled the skies after Russia this week unleashed its widest offensive against Ukrainian cities and towns since the start of the war. President Biden today blasting Russia's attacks on civilian infrastructure. And it's brutal. It's, it's just it's, it's beyond the pale. It comes after President Biden said he does not believe Russian President Putin will use nuclear weapons but slammed his threats to unleash them. And as Russia lashes out, there's a growing concern here in Ukraine. Russian officials have called on Putin to attack Ukraine with small, so-called tactical nuclear weapons. Ukrainians seem unafraid, saying that would only rally the world even more to support Ukraine in its fight for survival against Russia. Meanwhile, global condemnation grows as the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution by a large majority, calling on countries not to recognize the four regions of Ukraine which Russia has claimed, following so-called referendums held late last month and demanding that Moscow reverse the course on its attempted illegal annexation. In what they called an attempted illegal annexation, the UN General Assembly passed a resolution by a large majority calling on countries not to recognize the four regions of Ukraine, which were claimed by Russia after recent disputed referendums. The results of the vote showed that 143 member countries voted in favor of the resolution, while five voted against and 35 abstained. The five countries that voted against were Russia, Belarus, North Korea, Nicaragua and Syria, while China and India chose to abstain. Those who voted in favor of the resolution say it's a move to reaffirm the sovereignty, independence, unity and territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. And it's a strong, strong signal to the world and to Russia that they cannot intimidate the world. It's a message from the world that they need to cease their aggression against Ukraine. Russia, however, responded with a warning that the latest vote could end any chance at a diplomatic solution to the crisis in Ukraine. Today, however, the General Assembly has been presented with a politicized and openly provocative document that not only ignores all of these facts, but also contains a confrontational charge that could destroy any and all efforts in favor of a diplomatic solution to the crisis in Ukraine. The latest vote at the UN General Assembly mirrors that of 2014 after Russia annexed Ukraine's Crimea. At the time, the General Assembly adopted a resolution declaring the referendum invalid with 100 votes in favor, 11 against and 58 formal abstentions. Prior to Wednesday's vote, the United States and other Western countries lobbied for the resolution with U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken convening a virtual meeting on Tuesday with diplomats from more than 100 countries. Ukraine's NATO-led allies have also announced deliveries of advanced air defense weapons to Kiev after a spate of Russian missile strikes. The bloc continues to place top priority towards military support in the case of any future cannonade by the Russian forces. How to increase weapon deliveries to Ukraine? The question facing defence ministers at NATO headquarters in Brussels Wednesday. 
Following this week's airstrikes over Ukraine that killed innocent civilians and destroyed critical energy infrastructure, the big focus is on air defence systems. The state-of-the-art Iris T air defence system has been delivered from Germany to Ukraine and has already arrived there, a very important support for Ukraine in the fight against rocket fire, against this terror that is being exercised against a population. This rocket fire is something we are currently experiencing. NATO defence ministers will also be discussing how to replenish their weapons stock, as well as the Russian president's disturbing threat to use nuclear weapons. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg is staying calm for now. Uh, this will have uh, severe consequences for Russia. Uh, Russia knows that the nuclear war uh, cannot be won, must never be uh, fought. And um, uh, we are, of course, also closely monitoring um, uh, the Russian nuclear posture. Uh, we haven't seen any changes in the uh, nuclear posture of uh, Russia, but we will remain vigilant. It has done so magnificently. Jens Stoltenberg has also asked Belarus to stop being an accomplice to Russia. The Belarusian president, Alexander Lukashenko, announced earlier this week that thousands of Russian troops would be arriving in his country in the coming days for drills. According to the International Criminal Court's chief prosecutor, Vladimir Putin is not immune from war crimes prosecution if the evidence is pointed towards him. However, such a prosecution does not seem to be in the near future for the controversial leader. Vladimir Putin is not immune from war crimes prosecution if all the evidence points to him being guilty of war crimes. The International Criminal Court's chief prosecutor, Karim Khan, who is currently investigating offences on the ground in Ukraine, says the Russian president's position would not allow him escape with impunity. Neither is superior orders a defence, nor is the official position of an individual as a general or as a president or as a prime minister uh, grounds for immunity. There's no immunity for international crimes and the, one of the Nuremberg principles, uh, as, uh, as, as you'll know, is that there's no statute of limitations for war crimes or crimes against humanity. Putin and the Russian army are accused of committing war crimes throughout Ukraine, with indiscriminate bombings, rape, murder and torture all being used against the civilian population. Karim Khan said this requires the law to intervene. One thing is clear. You cannot deliberately, intentionally target civilian objects, mm. schools and hospitals, uh, places of residence of civilians, you, unless they're being used for, to gain a distinct military advantage. The ICC chief prosecutor also says international law is now more important than ever, given the current crisis in Ukraine. I think the law has a role to play. Uh, it won't solve all the world's problems. But we need to make sure that it is seen to uh, be relevant in these most critical moments that uh, your viewers are living through, that we're all living through. It, it, this is not a Hollywood movie. Uh, th this is not something that uh, is some drama. This is something that is up close and personal to too many. Khan and his joint investigative team are currently looking into war crimes in Ukraine with six other countries under the umbrella of Eurojust, the bloc's judicial cooperation agency. Russia says it has detained eight people in connection with Saturday's explosion on a key bridge linking Russia to Crimea. The Russian forces claim it was an act of terrorism done by Ukrainians. Russia's security service has released a video which it claims shows the lorry involved in Saturday's attack on the bridge linking Crimea to Russia. Moscow says eight suspects, including five Russians, have been arrested in connection with the blast. The FSB alleges the vehicle was packed with explosives, which was sent by ship from the port of Odessa in Ukraine, passing through Bulgaria, Georgia and Armenia before arriving in Russia. It claims those arrested were acting on the orders of Ukrainian military intelligence, which Kyiv has dismissed as nonsense. The 12-kilometer Kerch Bridge is a vital transport and supply link between southern Russia and Crimea, which was illegally annexed by Moscow after its 2014 invasion. Authorities are struggling to re-establish road and rail lines on the heavily damaged structure. Russia described the incident as a terrorist attack 
and launched successive waves of devastating airstrikes across Ukraine in retaliation. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. The Russian leader also announced that they are willing to consider the resuming of energy supply despite the situation, claiming the attack on the Nord Stream pipelines was an attempt by the US to weaken Europe by disrupting the flow of cheap gas from Russia. Putin. Russian President Vladimir Putin said the ball is in the court of the European Union, declaring that he is ready to resume gas supplies to Europe. Speaking at the Moscow Energy Forum, Russia's leader also blamed the US for explosions that damaged pipeline links, transporting Russian gas under the Baltic Sea. There is no doubt that this is an act of international terrorism. The purpose of which is to undermine the energy security of the entire continent. Logic, cynical, to destroy, block sources of cheap energy, deprive millions of people, industrial consumers of gas, heat, electricity and other resources and force them to buy all this at much higher prices. To force. Several European governments claim that the pipeline explosions were a result of sabotage, but stop short of blaming anyone in particular. These and other acts of sabotage have frustrated EU efforts to combat inflation. EU energy ministers met in Prague on Wednesday to discuss a possible agreement on energy prices, which is set to be endorsed by EU leaders next week. Over in the US now, the Biden administration has unveiled its first national security strategy, highlighting China as its main competitor, as well as its biggest geopolitical challenge. The report also mentioned North Korea vowing to strengthen the extended deterrence against the regime. America's most consequential geopolitical challenge. This is how the Biden administration has described China in an official report outlining its security and foreign policy objectives, which was released on Wednesday. Biden's national security strategy, a Congress-mandated document, was planned to be delivered in January, but that was put on hold due to the war in Ukraine. In the latest security plan, the U.S. defined the strategic threats that the country is facing in two categories, competition with major powers like China and global challenges like climate change, the pandemic, and inflation. In order to win in its competition with China, the U.S. says it will continue to enhance and expand its alliances while bolstering investments in underlying sources and tools of American power and influence. Along with China-related issues, the strategy also mentioned constraining the threat from Russia as another priority, but differentiated between the two. It said Russia poses an immediate threat to international society due to its ongoing war, while saying China is the only country with both the intent to reshape the international order as well as the economic, diplomatic, military and technological power to advance that objective. The U.S. also reaffirmed its commitment to complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula through diplomacy, vowing to bolster extended deterrence against North Korea to rein in missile threats. North Korea was mentioned three times in the latest strategy document compared to 17 times in the previous administration's NSS report. Meanwhile, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan says the U.S. has decided to strengthen cooperation with other countries comprehensively to deal with global challenges. We have some good news for you. A genetic disease is defined as rare if it occurs in fewer than one in every 2,000 people. A South Korean research team discovered a way to detect these conditions using AI. This significantly reduces the time it takes to filter through the initial genetic mutation classification with great accuracy. One domestic bio company analyzes the results of genetics tests of people with rare genetic diseases. The process analyzes a patient's entire genetic makeup and classifies the information on mutations into five categories – pathogenic, likely pathogenic, a variant of uncertain significance, likely benign or benign. This process, done manually by a person, takes two to three hours, but the use of artificial intelligence has reduced that time down to around five minutes. 
Genetic analysis usually shows 80,000 mutations per person. In order to identify each gene for a mutation from the 80,000, we use Excel filters, various databases, or sometimes do it manually. It takes two to three hours. Now we've automated this process. The bio company has developed a way for AI to learn interpretation skills based on over 100 million pieces of genetic mutation data related to rare genetic diseases. This includes identifying the mutations and classifying them based on the frequency of the mutation's occurrence. The number of genetic mutations can vary widely depending on the type of rare genetic disease, but the AI is able to predict the relevance of the mutations even for those with uncertain composition. Using an algorithm, the process quantifies how the mutations match the patient's symptoms and is able to help doctors make final decisions. Training AI helps us filter the data first. There is an overflow of information from all the variations, but the technology lets us know what can be ignored and what has partial relevance and other information that really helps doctors with the initial process. In collaboration with Seoul National University Bundang Hospital, the bio company analyzed the genetics of 200 patients with hearing loss. The AI results showed a 97% match with the medical staff's diagnosis. This study was recently published in an international journal. More than 80% of rare diseases, some 8,000 types, are genetic. With such a variety of genetic mutations, having a technology that provides quick and accurate analysis is key to diagnosing rare genetic diseases. A month after Masha Amini's tragic passing, mass protests and crackdowns have continued to claim hundreds of lives. According to human rights groups, the discontent has spread, posing a serious challenge to the structural and political integrity of the Islamic Republic. Students, mainly young women, gathered at a roundabout near the Islamic Assad University in central Tehran to protest. They chanted, we don't want spectators, join us. They demonstrated at risk to their lives. Elsewhere in the Iranian capital, riot police were out in force in a bid to contain anti-government protests. Still in the capital, this amateur video footage shows lawyers fleeing tear gas during a rally outside the Bar Association. Video footage being posted online suggests there's no let-up in anger in cities nationwide. Almost one month on from the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini, the Kurdish-Iranian woman died following her arrest by the morality police in Tehran for allegedly failing to observe the Islamic Republic's dress code for women. Protests and strikes are going ahead despite internet shutdowns by the authorities and a police crackdown. The group Iran Human Rights is reporting on its website that at least 201 people, including 23 children, have been killed. One political analyst says the Iranian leadership could step up its crackdown. It has mostly used uh, anti-riot police uh, in the past uh, few weeks. Uh, it has not yet deployed the Revolutionary Guard, uh, and so it still has uh, a lot of repressive tools uh, up its sleeve that it can use uh, against the movement. This is the biggest wave of social unrest to grip Iran in almost three years. Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, on Wednesday again accused Iran's enemies of stoking what he said were street riots. Welcome back. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. At least 35 people have died and more than 12 others are missing after prolonged monsoon downpours caused floods and landslides in Nepal's Karnali province. Japan had to blow up its unmanned space rocket mid-flight. The Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency said the self-destruct signal was sent in the final stage of the flight after the rocket went off course. According to North Korea state media, the regime's leader Kim Jong-un reportedly oversaw the test firing of two long-range strategic cruise missiles that successfully hit a target 2,000 kilometers away. Satellite images released by Maxa Technology show queues of traffic building on roads near the partially damaged Crimea Bridge. Over the past three months, shipmakers have cut their earnings expectations at the fastest pace in 14 years amid a weakening of demand and other factors.
And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you have missed any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. And finally, we leave you with the visuals of the world's best freestyle footballers gathered in Croatia to take part in the 2022 Red Bull Street Style Finals. Thank you for watching and have a great night.